Hi guys, this is David Jaffe. I'm here with Lucas, who is one of the best biohackers. This is a real treat. Now, I know that biohacking and health is not the topic of my channel. It's more so trading. However, I wanted to take this opportunity and share his knowledge with you guys, because remember, when your brain is, is operating in an optimal state, then you're going to be able to make better decisions. If you live longer, then you're going to be able to make more money, live with less stress, and live a happier and more fulfilling life. So this is not something that we're going to do all the time, but at the same time, I just didn't want to pass up this opportunity because Lucas is someone that I believe everybody should follow. So without further ado, Lucas, can you introduce yourself? Yeah, sure. Thanks for thanks for having me, David. Um, so yeah, obviously my name is Lucas. I'm a qualified naturopath. So I studied naturopathy for four years. I also have a background in exercise science. Um, and I've been very passionate and interested in all things human health and uh, various ways in which we can enhance human performance, whether that be mental performance or even physical performance. Um, so I guess my background is very heavily focused on uh, nootropics or cognitive enhancers compounds that can improve you know various aspects of cognitive function which again will have a very powerful effect on decision making um, and just success in business so I guess my journey really started out as a pure passion project and then from there just really started diving deep into research and fell in love with the whole um, health optimization space and weren't you also a professional athlete as well yeah, so I also, um, my background, I used to play soccer. Well, I guess some of you guys, others would call it football. Um, mm -hmm. So I played for a number of years. I actually went overseas. I went to uh, Budapest uh, in Hungary to represent Australia at one stage. Um, so it's quite a, I took my soccer very seriously. Like I used to sacrifice quite a lot. Um, and I used to experiment. That's where all the experimentation really started with, many of these supplementation hacks and the nootropics was really to see how these compounds could impact my decision-making on the soccer field, um, whether or not that improved my ability to read the play. Um, and I found there were so many different compounds that would have a pretty dramatic effect, like a very noticeable effect on my awareness on the soccer field. So yeah, that's sort of how it sort of stemmed from there. Do you think it was a situation where you realized that from an innate skill perspective, you were, you know, average or maybe slightly above average or around the median, but that by using some of these supplements, you can actually gain a significant edge in the competitive landscape and then play above your, in, your innate and inherent skill level. Absolutely. I think um, one thing that I realized early on was like the massive variability in my performance, depending upon what I would eat, how I would sleep, some of the um my my level of arousal like a like general energy levels before 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 a game and then i started realizing that there were certain compounds that could um just make me feel calmer usually i would get a little bit uptight and tense before a match um and then i realized there was like compounds like l-theanine and and taurine that would keep me sort of calmer and i remember having one of the i remember playing like one of my absolute best games when I first tried the combination of the very beginner nootropic with nootropic stack, which is um, L-theanine plus caffeine. And that combination was just such a, it was a, it was a pivotal moment for me because I was like, if I can consistently play in this manner with a cool, calm, confident approach to my game, then I can consistently perform at a high level. And there are, and it's just like minimizing the chances of um, just playing average basically. Yeah. And just like with trading, when you make better decisions, then you're going to make more money. And just to throw it in there, the Argentina France game was the final was the best soccer game I've ever seen that that was incredible. Um, the other thing is, now I know that people's time is pretty, pretty stretched thin and everyone's busy. So what makes you, you unique? I know that there's a lot of influencers and a, a lot of intelligent people in the health space. So I'm not asking you in any way to put down other people. Rather, I'm, I'm asking you, why should people 
give their most valuable asset, which, which is their time and their attention to you, as opposed to some other people that they may be following, or if they're considering following, what makes you unique and what's your value proposition? Yeah, it's a good, good question. I mean, I guess my, um, my unique factor is that I've been very hands-on in the space and I've spent a lot of time scouring different um, clinical journals and um, research papers. And I've like, I've been the guy that always tries to go to the very primary source of information. And again, of course, there's like many studies out there that are corrupt and I'm aware of how they can critique and or um, skew the data of certain health studies to make it sound better and make it appear better depending upon you know the health organization that funded the study um, but I've been going I've been learning from sources of information that I think are very highly credible um, Dr. Ray Pete is someone that I've looked up to for a number of years and learned a lot from him um, and then also I set well, I set notifications on like just like people set notifications uh, on um, various like influencers and YouTubers and Instagram. I set notifications on like PubMed, which is a research database. So I'm like always trying to find like I'm I'm the first to know about studies that come out. So I'm, I guess that's like my unique factor. I I think that you're being extremely modest and. Um from listening to a lot of your podcasts, I think that the great value proposition that you have is that you, like you said, you literally scour through hundreds of research studies and then you break them down into very easy to understand information. Additionally, a lot of what, a lot of your podcasts, they don't necessarily parrot back and agree with what many other people say. So for example, I listened to your podcast about iodine where mm -hmm. The general consensus is that everyone should take as much iodine as possible. But then you had someone on where you guys discussed where, wait, like, hold on a second. Maybe the amount of iodine that people are taking um, is actually doing some harm to, to your body and, um, and things of that nature. So, I, you know, I definitely think that you're a unique source of information. And, you know, you're in some respects, you're, you're similar to Paul Saladino in that Saladino also from my understanding, looks through a lot of the, the studies and he actually looks at how the studies were structured and put together. And then he says, no guys, even though the conclusion of this study might be, yeah. might be this, but the actual study is based upon correlations or it was sponsored by, by this company. So I don't agree with the study and, it, and the conclusion might actually be bunk. So I think that, that you know, you're you're really searching for the truth and i think that that's a great way of building an audience and i think that's that that's one of the best reasons why people should follow you yeah i i do appreciate that david i think also as part of it is like you have to have a very critical mind and you have to be a very good critical thinker um to to look at something at face value and take it and fully believe in what you read is i think a trap that a lot of people fall into in the health space and even also into in the um in the trading space as well, like, you know, I'm sure a lot of people would dive deep into um, like articles and blogs in, in trading space and, and they don't dive deeper into like, you know, what is the underlying intention of the author and things like that. Um, and I think practitioners like Paul Saladino, that's a good example. There are a lot of other great practitioners out there as well um, that I also consider like a wealth of information. Dr. Andrew Huberman's one of them. Um, you know, there's a range of other practitioners, but I guess like, yeah, I'm, my mission and objective is to bring forward extremely new, unique and novel health information that people will struggle to find on Google. And how this applies to trading is that we don't just want to read the headlines or the summary. You actually want to look into the variability. So if someone actually has like a two to 300% return, which is potentially possible if they like buy some call options on Tesla and then they get lucky and fortunate, then you really have to ask yourself how they accomplish that and what the variability of their returns are because the next year, such as in 2022, where Tesla fell like 70%, if you're over leveraged on call options in Tesla, then you can actually blow up your account and lose 90 to 95%. So the nuance is very important. And I think that Lucas does a really good job at analyzing the nuance and then 
coming to an independent conclusion on whether you can trust trust what the conclusions are. Yeah. So the the second thing, the second question that I have is, what do you think are the the biggest mistakes on a high level that most people who are watching this make? Well, I guess when it comes to health optimization and improving your overall general well-being and vitality, um, I guess like some of the biggest mistakes people make is uh, like following mainstream media advice when it comes to um, nutrition. A, a good example would be, you know, to avoid saturated fat. Um, we see that time and time again in the media talking about how we need to avoid saturated fats and focus our food intake on polyunsaturated fatty acids, which are vegetable oils, which are actually perhaps one of the most toxic um, introductions to food overall in the past 20 to 30 years is the inclusion of these vegetable oils. So things like um, canola oil, rapeseed oil, safflower oil, sunflower oil, soybean oil. Um, all of these are really problematic for a lot of people. And the reason why they're problematic is because these will directly lower a person's level of ATP production, which is the body's energy currency. So whereas saturated fats, they're better utilized by the body. They don't cause as much peripheral damage. They're better metabolized by the body. Um, and so I guess the biggest mistake that people make is like, for example, a simple one would be swapping over from you know, organic butter to the other versions of like margarine or yeah. those, those fake butters, for example. Correct me if I'm wrong, and I'm, I'm not an expert in this at all, but the omega-6, it's high in linoleic acid, which then makes up your membranes. And then it leads to inflammation, which can oftentimes kill the actual cell. And unlike sugar, which your body can oftentimes burn off with like a hard exercise routine or just a little bit of fasting, the linoleic acid or the polyunsaturated fats the, or the bad fats rather um, from the vegetable oils, they can actually stay in your body for about two to three years. Is that accurate or did I make a mistake? No, you're, you're correct in saying that the, poly, like the polyunsaturated fatty acids that we consume, they can accumulate in the cell, in and around the cell. Um, and they're actually what makes the cell fluid. And um, I guess like a good way to look at this is the brain is mostly made up of fat. Um, mm -hmm. And so we want to be coating the sheath, the myelin sheath with a, with a healthy fat. And by using or consuming these polyunsaturated fatty acids, they're highly prone to something known as peroxidation. So it means that they're very unstable. So they can elicit peripheral damage it's like having collateral damage in the brain um, destroying other neurons promoting the progression of alzheimer's disease um, promoting the progression of uh, parkinson's disease um, so i guess you know this is one key mistake that that people make so the best the the one of the biggest bang for your buck um, changes that people can make is to throw out like the canola oil and things of that nature and to just use just regular, or just regular butter or like beef tallow or or maybe even like coconut oil as well because it's relatively low in linoleic acid. But generally, butter is probably the the best thing, right? Yeah, I think um, we could rank them. We could say things like um, grass fed butter, coconut oil, um, as you mentioned, tallow is also a great example, and then also. Um, we can, and olive oil as well. Olive oil should be in that list, I think, or ex, extra virgin olive oil, um, purely based on the fact that we have quite a lot of data from the Mediterranean diet studies that looks at, obviously it's not just the olive oil, but olive oil is a very um, key constituent of their, well, key, key part of their diet. And so I think olive oil should also, extra virgin olive oil should also be considered um, up there as well. The one caveat to that is if you're doing olive oil, you have, you're kind of making the assumption and putting your confidence in the bottler 
or in the manufacturer that that olive oil is not actually adulterated because a lot of the olive oil, even stuff that, I mean, at restaurants, it's almost always cut with like canola oil and things of that nature. But even things that you buy in the store, it's usually cut and legitimate olive oil, it's actually very bitter and sometimes has like a little bit of a green tint to it. So for those reasons, because I'm just simply not confident in my ability to source amazing olive oil, I do tend to, to avoid it, unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah. There's, um, there's quite a lot of oils, olive oils that have, that have been adulterated and, um, there is, I'm, I'm pretty sure there's a, there are various ways of checking, like you said, the bitterness profile, um, and there's certain brands that are also approved. And what are, what's like one or two other big mistakes that you see people make besides consuming um, vegetable oils? I would say the second one is something that people do every single day, but they just completely overlook. And that would be um, drinking tap water. Um, and it depends which city or state that you live in. But I mean, over here in Australia, most tap water is um, loaded up with, with fluoride. Um, and it's also, I, I look at tap water as basically like chemical soup um, because... You know, there's lots of micro doses. It's all about the micro amounts of these trace elements um, that end up slowly accumulating over time. Um, fluoride is one example. There's a lot of debate around whether or not fluoride is actually beneficial to health. And in my opinion, we can achieve sufficient fluoride intake through other means. We don't have to get it from the, the water alone. Um, and there are other things, there are other elements and trace minerals that are beneficial for the enamel and teeth and for general um, overall tooth health um, that I think fluoride is not something we want to be consuming in tap water um, when they specifically add fluoride to tap water. Um, and so in addition to that, I think most people, if they're looking to just improve their general health and energy levels, um, would be to utilize a, a high quality water filter um, at least every single day or drink high quality water so that they're eliminating the root, the source of their toxin exposure. It's a pretty quick win for most people. I, I definitely agree. I think that, um, well, I want to plug my friend's website, truthaboutfluoride.com. Um, Casey, I've spoken to him numerous times. He is really, really good. And as many of you know, I had mold exposure in the last home and I actually moved to a new house. And today um, I actually installed a reverse osmosis filter. I got it from Home Master. I think it was like the iron one. So I have like a whole house filter. Um, I think I have the express water that I bought on Amazon. And then I also have a reverse osmosis that was installed today. Previous to that, I was using a Berkey, but I, you know, Casey on truthaboutfluoride.com came out with some interesting information regarding Berkey's filtering abilities. And then I switched over to a mega home distiller. The problem with the distiller, even though it gets down to zero total dissolved solids, is it's just simply not super efficient from a time perspective. I have to like fill it up every single gallon and then I have to clean it. And, you know, time is money. And I just, even though the reverse osmosis, gives you a slightly higher TDS. I think that from a bang for your buck perspective, um, the reverse osmosis is much better. The other thing is about fluoride. I don't remember ever reading any studies about like fluoride being super beneficial for anything besides potentially topical application to your teeth. So if you think about it, when you're drinking water, you know, you're, you're basically like, maybe there's like, a tenth of a second of contact with the water, with your teeth, but the rest of it you're actually consuming. So, you know, I, I'm also not a proponent of fluoridating the water. And actually that's probably the primary reason why I had to install a reverse osmosis filter because other things like lead or excess iron or other things is pretty easy to get out with like a activated carbon block or like a KDF 85 filter. But Fluoride is very, very difficult to get out unless you distill it or you use like activated alumina or you use a reverse osmosis filter. Yeah, really, really good points there. And also um, as far as like the way in which 
fluoride can lower energy and vitalities. Um, it has a high, high affinity, which means that it actually can um, accumulate in a part of the brain known as the uh, pineal gland. And by accumulating in the pineal gland, that's going to affect um, the body's melatonin production. And melatonin is the body's strongest. Exactly, yeah. So mass rocks and also circadian modulator. So that's a key point. And do you have one one more? Um, oh, another. The biggest mistakes? The last, uh, last one. If not, we can. I would say hmm, another basic health mistake that people make. Uh, geez, I reckon the, the other one that I think is like going to have the highest impact factor is uh, sedentary behavior. Um, and the reason I say this is because even very small amounts of um, movement, which is, not, which is considered non-exercise activity thermogenesis or NEAT, uh, can significantly increase your total caloric burn during the day. So if you know someone that's like a fidgeter, someone who just can't stop moving all the time, they're always like just very distracted or almost like ADHD, they can't stop moving their feet or bopping their feet. Well, it turns out that something known as the soleus push-up, which is when you just do like a calf raise with your, with your ankle, you're flexing up and down, up and down. That has been shown to massively reduce your risk of developing uh, type 2 diabetes by improving the body's overall glucose um, metabolism and glu glu uh, blood sugar response. So a, something, a, a really simple hack there would be to um, do 10 minutes of soleus push-up, so both sides, um, after a meal. And that, sim or even going for a walk, obviously going for a walk is the best thing. But if people just can't be bothered going for a walk, they can do these soleus push-ups. Um, and I think the, the key point here is just to not underestimate the impact that small amounts of physical activity can have on um, overall health optimization. So I guess for, for this, if you're working at an office and you're sitting down too much, then perhaps get up more often than, than you're used to. And then like Lucas was saying, uh, you know, basically like stand on your tippy toes, right? You would just get on your tippy toes and do like a set of that, or just take like a quick walk around the block. But um, if you're working from home, then you can use a standing desk or simply put your computer on a chair. So if you, if you want like a, a hack where you don't have to spend the money on a standing desk, then you can do things like that. But getting a standing desk and trying to not sit down as often is, um, is definitely worthwhile. I guess um, one more that I would add is, is probably uh, just try to go to bed a little bit earlier and improve your sleep quality, like um, wear an eye mask, reduce the amount of, of blue light that you're exposed to after about 7 or 8 p.m. You can wear like blue blocking glasses. You can pick them up on Amazon for pretty cheap, um, you know, anywhere from like 20 to $30, which should end up blocking out like 95% plus of the blue light. And, um, you know, perhaps try to go to sleep like an hour or two earlier, and then you can wake up an hour or two earlier. Um, that way your circadian rhythms are, are more aligned. Those are, those are awesome recommendations that, to be honest, are pretty, um, they're pretty easy to, to implement, in, in my opinion. So for the next question, um, regarding the biggest changes, I think that we kind of hit on that. Uh, the next question was going to be the biggest changes that people can make. But I think that we kind of provided solutions to that with the biggest mistakes that, that people can make. And I don't want to overwhelm people because, in effect, if you commit yourself to making two or three or three or four changes, then, in my opinion, that could dramatically improve your life, your mental clarity, your decision making, and also your overall wealth. So I think that's fine. Do you have an opinion on um, supplements that you believe? The majority of people should take? Yeah, well, when, when it comes to supplementation, I'm very, um, as with most things, very evidence based. And I always like to look at it from a personalized and individual, individualized approach. However, in saying that, there is pretty good data on various supplements and vitamins that do appear to be 
um, like highly prevalent in terms of its deficiency. So a good example of this is vitamin D. Now, vitamin D is a supplement, very common supplement you see in pharmacies and, and you know whole food stores and things like that, um, that in my opinion, by correcting someone's vitamin D level, if their levels are suboptimal, can have a very dramatic positive effect on their immune health, bone health, hormonal status, sleep quality, um, mood, brain function, liver function, kidney function. Um, so I think one supplement that I think a lot of people can benefit from if they're not if their levels are not sufficient or not optimal is to replenish their vitamin D levels. And for some people that might mean that they need to take five, six, seven, eight capsules a day of um, the 1000 IU vitamin D that we often find. Um, most of the time, most people need at least 5,000 IU to 10,000 IU of vitamin D per day through supplement form. Um, the reason why I say supplement form is by far the very best way to get vitamin D is through sunlight exposure. Having said that, for some people, you know, they just don't have exposure to sun. They can't go outside What and it's difficult. So therefore, in their case, supplementation is oftentimes recommended. Do you have, and on vitamin D, my understanding is it's kind of like it's a little bit of a steroid and it's kind of like a master modulator. And if you're taking D, then you should try to take D3 and try to combine it with vitamin K2 because it shuttles it and decreases the possibility of calcification in, in your arteries. And um, do, do you remember what the, um, what the level, if people want to get a D, um, if they want to check their vitamin D levels at, what, what's your understanding on like the, the best levels, what, what it should be over? Uh, it's a good question. So when it comes to vitamin D, it depends on the lab that's used and then the, and the units that they use in the, in the laboratory. Um, but oftentimes you'll see like, it'll say um, less than 20 is deficient. They usually say about 50 to 75 is considered in that sort of optimal sweet zone. Um, there is a very high, nut, like if you're above 100 or 125, um, that can be toxic as well. So vitamin D really need to find that sweet spot for your biology because I know a number of people who have suggested vitamin D to um, who they've taken 5,000 IU uh, for like, let's say four weeks. And the other person has taken 5,000 IU for four weeks. And this first individual saw a massive increase in their vitamin D levels, whereas the other person had, you know, a poor ability to actually utilize the vitamin D. So it comes back to um, individuality and also just being um, ruthless with your, with your doctor and, and just demanding that your doctor or, or your MD um, assesses your vitamin D levels. Especially if you're in the, the higher latitudes, because obviously if the sun is lower in the sky, then it's going to decrease your, your ability to absorb it. And, um, you know, I, I think, and I think the, the measurement in the United States might be like NG um, to ML. I'm not hundred percent certain on that, but, you know, aiming for something between like 50 or a hundred uh, or 50 to 75, as you said, right? I think that that would be like the, the target. Um, do you have any others that, that you would recommend? Uh, the other supplement that I think a lot of people can derive a lot of benefit from is a, a very high quality magnesium supplement. Um, the reason I say that again is because of the widespread deficiency in magnesium. Um, and so by correcting your magnesium stores or status, through supplementation, again, you can aim to get it from food, but it's quite difficult to achieve 400 milligrams per day. Um, and even going a, bit, a little bit beyond this can be beneficial, particularly for individuals who are under a lot of stress, who are training or exercising, sweating a lot. Um, magnesium, in particular, the magnesium glycinate is, one of, is a good form. And then also magnesium taurate, which is... Um, magnesium and taurine combined. Um, these two appear to have some pretty robust evidence to support overall metabolic health. Perfect, yeah. And 
If you're looking for magnesium, try to avoid the magnesium oxide because the absorption on that is, is pretty low. What are your thoughts on, I wrote down a few and I don't wanna, wanna overwhelm people with um, too much. You know, If they can take maybe like three or four vitamins um, a day, then that, then that, would, then that would be great. Um, you know, something like creatine, B vitamins, collagen, glycine. I know that, that glycine is a component in collagen, um, but what are your thoughts about like creatine, B vitamins, collagen, and, and glycine? Do you think that that's like... Yeah, I do think these are also um, creatine. We're getting, we're seeing more and more research on the benefits of creatine for a big demographic, like a wide demographic, not just for athletes and bodybuilders, but also to prevent cognitive decline, improve memory performance, even in the elderly past the age of 50, in that 50 to 75 age range. Um, so I think creatine is beneficial. Glycine is also a really powerful anti-aging amino acid. Um, it, it switches on genes that promote longevity and good health. Um, it also favors high quality sleep. So you can take that in the evening. Um, so creatine, glycine, they're also beneficial. Collagen is important for connective tissue and tendon health and things like that. Um, so these are also, again, very simple supplements that can have a, and very cheap as well. Yeah, you know, glycine is super cheap. Creatine like is super cheap. Yeah. Five to 10 cents a day could go a long way. Awesome. Now switching away from the supplements regarding like biohacks so that people and people watching the channel can try to optimize. So we have the component about what they feed themselves, what they take in order to boost their biology. Now, what about some additional things as far as like biohacks, such as like saunas or, or things like that? Do you have thoughts regarding um, some of the biggest biohacks that people can, can implement that would have the biggest change in their life? Yeah, I'd say first and foremost, the one that has had the biggest impact on my quality of life and also my clients' like general health and well-being is um, to wear blue blockers before bed. Um, so those, there are specific glasses that filter out the, the blue light. Um, these have a very dramatic effect on not only your ability to fall asleep, but also the quality of your sleep. Um, and so I think wearing these glasses around two to three hours before your desired bedtime. So let's say your desired bedtime, you want to fall asleep at 10 o'clock. You know, you put the glasses on at around 7, 7.30-ish. Um, and by 10 o'clock, your melatonin levels will start to accumulate and build up and it promotes healthy quality sleep. It's a very simple, you know, very simple, easy, quick win. It's a non-supplement um, drug-free uh, strategy to improve sleep quality. Awesome. And regarding that, I think the one that a lot of the health professionals um, recommend, that the health professionals that I trust and respect, didn't I think it's Bond Charge. Did they change their name from Blue Blocks to Bond Charge? Um, in my, I actually don't have a pair. I use a pair that was very highly reviewed on, on Amazon that I got for about $30 and it wraps around. And as Lucas said, you want to reduce your blue light um, exposure because it suppresses your melatonin production and therefore it's going to decrease your ability to fall asleep and also decrease a lot of the, the restorative qualities of your deep sleep and, and things of that nature. And you can get a pair for anywhere from, you know, 20 to $80. So it's pretty cheap and you can wear it for, you know, starting at about 6 or 7 p.m. Do you have a another biohack that um that you would recommend absolutely it, it, um on the same light no no pun intended is uh morning morning sunlight exposure um so if possible within 30 minutes of waking up in the morning try to go outside not through a window um we want to actually physically go outside and don't stare at the sun unless i don't recommend that um, although I have done that in the past when the, the sun is at the point where you can actually technically, you can look at the sun without it damaging your eyes. There is such thing as sun gazing, but there'll be a lot of, uh, there'll be a lot of people listening in thinking this guy's a, this guy's crazy. If he, uh, he looks at the sun or recommends looking at the sun. Um, 
But getting morning sunlight exposure within 30 minutes of, of waking up will, the, there's a quote that I like to use is good quality sleep starts as soon as you wake up. So good quality sleep that night actually starts as soon as you wake up. If you get sunlight exposure first thing in the morning, you're going to enforce and entrain your body circadian rhythm to release cortisol. That's right. We want to release and increase cortisol production in the morning, just like, which is one of the mechanisms by which why so many people love drinking coffee in the morning is because they're getting that slight uptick in cortisol to get them going. The sun, sunlight exposure and light exposure also helps to trigger that cascading effect. Um, so I think that's a really simple biohack, like a really simple way to encourage healthy energy levels to regulate your appetite as well during the day um, is by going outside and, and exposing your face as much of your body to the sun in the morning. Even though that's extremely simple and that one's free, that is the one that I actually struggle with because I have like OCD and repetitive thoughts. And then when I wake up in the morning, I'm just like, okay, got to check email, got to do this, got to do this. And um, I have, I struggle with that one to do it consistently. So uh, I want to hold myself accountable and try to improve that and get outside more in the morning. Because, you know, like you said, when you increase the cortisol levels in the morning, it, it, resets your circadian rhythm and your circadian clock and it actually helps you the next day because you're able to sleep better that evening and you're able to um you're able to think more clearly and make better decisions so that's amazing and it's free do you have another one uh the other one is for men and i'm sure you're familiar with what i'm about I to mention i know what you're gonna say i think <laughs> all right go on the um, icing of the icing your balls um okay now, the reason I, I talk favorably about this, and this doesn't mean literally to go into the freezer and grab, a, grab an ice pack or an ice cubes and apply it directly to your testicles. What I mean here is um, applying the ice pack up against the underwear or, or your jocks um, and doing that about 10 to 15 minutes uh, for about 10 to 15 minutes, two to three times per day. And the reason I say this is because uh, most men notice an increase in energy levels, increase in general sexual performance, um, erection quality, and overall like vitality just by icing. Um, and the reason for this is because, you know, most men don't realize this, but when the testic the testes are two, just two degrees too warm, or they're, they're above their recommended temperature, this can completely arrest spermatogenesis. And it can massively affect fertility and testosterone production. Um, so a really simple, quick little hack um, that you know men can implement is to um, consider icing their 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 balls. <laughs> See, when you turn it, when you tune in and watch videos from Best Stock Strategy, I bet you didn't expect that one of the best biohackers in the world would tell you to ice your balls, and also. Take a step back and realize that Lucas just gave you three amazing recommendations and the total cost for this is probably in total about $50. I'm sure that many of us have an ice pack that shipped with like probiotics or anything like that, or one of those reusable ice packs in our freezer. That is free and you can do that for 10 or 15 minutes while also multitasking and doing something else. Waking up in the morning and getting sun is also free. You can do that for 15 minutes and you can get a great blue blocking glasses for anywhere from 30 to $80 on Amazon or elsewhere. So some of the best things that you can implement to improve your health are only going to, are very easy to implement, not going to take you that much time and they're practically free. So I think that, that that's amazing. Awesome. Yeah. I think there's some really great little um, tips there. Great. The, the next thing, um, just circling back, because I know that your expertise is in brain health and decision making. Do you have, like, what are um, like one or two of the best nootropics and, or nootropics? I'm not sure exactly how to, um, how to pronounce it, but what are some of the best nootropics that can improve like decision making 
or short-term memory, like working memory that, that you've experienced? From, a, from the decision-making and um, lateral thinking and memory side of things, um, Hoopazine A um, has been pretty like beneficial in my experience with um, like studying information or to, like trying to juggle different tasks all at once. Um, this is purely based on the fact that it can keep the acetylcholine, which is the neurotransmitter that's responsible for memory and retention and um, I guess lateral thinking, um, it keeps acetylcholine active in the brain longer. And by doing that, uh, you, you will likely notice an improvement in short-term memory and working memory. Um, and so like very low doses, this is microgram dosage, dosages, by the way. Um, we're looking at about 100 micrograms, which is much smaller than 100 milligrams. Uh, make sure you get that dosage right. I, I personally it's just use... MC, MCG is the abbreviation, right? Yeah, Did that's you... correct. It's, okay. it's one of the most commonly... Um, uh, overdosed supplements on the market accidentally. So um, make sure it's micrograms, yeah, MCG, but that's, I use uh, nootropicsdepot.com. Um, yep. And they, they've they got some good quality um, Hoopazine A already encapsulated. So the capsule form is also really good. Yeah, I've used nootropicsdepot.com as well. They uh, They have lab tests for um, the COA, like uh, for their analysis, it's like free of heavy metals and they're a very reliable source. Do you have another nootropic that you recommend besides Huprazine? Yeah, um, the other one is uh, uridine monophosphate. Uh, that one there for me was a compound that changed my perspective of work. Well, it, it basically shifted my um tendencies sometimes i fall into the trap of procrastinating slightly so sometimes just to initiate a task i'll tend to like dwell on it or just find peace in being comfortable and just like not attacking the task um, but uridine just changes your perspective of the way you perceive a task and then all of a sudden that task becomes something that you feel like you can completely tackle because you have the brain energy the brain power and capacity to actually dedicate yourself to that task. Um, so looking at about 100 milligrams of uridine monophosphate to about 200 milligrams um, works really well in the morning. Definitely not before bed because it's energizing and stimulating. Um, that's really good for just like getting shit done sort of thing. Are there any contraindications of like Huprazine or Uridine that people should be aware of if they want to go and, and buy it from Nootropics Depot or elsewhere that, you know, if people are taking um, like an SSRI for acetylcholine, you know, um, for things like that for Huprazine, are there any contraindications that they should be careful of or be wary? And I know that you're not a doctor and this isn't medical advice, but things from things that you've read. Um, so the Huperzine A, the only major contraindication would be um, if you're d using other acetylcholine supplements, such as CDP choline or alpha GPC, um, sometimes having too much choline is also a bad thing. You'll find this is the case with most hormones and neurotransmitters is that like, just like with most things in life, too much of anything is not good. Um, the same thing applies with acetylcholine, too much acetylcholine. If you're combining Huperzine A with um, heaps of eggs and taking CDP choline and um, alpha GPC, that can be problematic and lead to excess acetylcholine. Um, the second one with uridine monophosphate, the, the only other major side effect is that it can, um, it can, I guess, like deplete the body of B vitamins quicker. So make sure you're um, replenishing with your B vitamins, a B complex, whilst you use uridine. Awesome. That's, that's great advice. Now, um, as many of you know, I had some, some mold exposure and I think that mold is actually very common. And I actually listened to a podcast that you had on mold and I don't want to spend like 
too much time on, on this question because I, I don't think a lot of the audience has mold exposure, although I think it's more common than, than people think. But what are your thoughts regarding like uh, the best ways to prevent mold? And then if you have some exposure, like how to, how to get rid of it? Yeah, it's a really, it's a stealth uh, contributor to poor health and ill health. Um, mold exposure is, it's ubiquitous. I mean, it can be, you know, underneath your carpet, it can be um, underneath your sink, it can be on your shower head, it can be in your bathroom, it can be in your tiles. Um, exposure to mold, whilst there are some forms of mold that are non-problematic, a lot of them actually are problematic and they can build up into the lungs that the particles can make their way down the trachea into the lungs and accumulate. Um, so I would say like the best ways to eliminate mold exposure. Um, one practitioner that I really recommend is um, Brian Carr. He's from Mold Finders. Um, he's great. He's got a really good Instagram channel. that goes through um, ways to identify mold and remove mold. Um, he was doing, on your podcast, right? Yeah, that's correct. He was, uh, yeah, the, the guy, he got into the business because like his father-in-law, like, uh, found, like helped him when he was dating his daughter or something. And then he decided that, oh, this stuff is super interesting. And then he, he built up a business about it, right? That's it. Jeez, you got yeah. a better business than me. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm sorry to interrupt. I, I just thought that that was, no, so that's, about, that's... so moldfinders.com you, you were saying? Yeah, he's got some great content. He he's he would speak much like more professionally than than I than I can on on mold. But I do know there are strategies that you know we can implement to um, like uh, reduce mold buildup in the body. Um, and so there's different ways in which we can achieve that. Awesome. So um, I think that this was incredibly helpful. We we really went through some of the most simplest things that many of them are free and they take very little time. It's not overwhelming. And I think that this would drastically improve the quality of your life, your ability to remember things, your brain health, and also your long-term wealth as well. Because when you're not sleeping well, when you're not healthy, when you're not operating in tip-top shape, then it's going to affect your decision-making, your ability to get work done, and your ability to enjoy your life and make money if, if that's one of your primary goals. Lucas, is there anything else? But, um, and we'll touch upon like where people can find you, but is there anything else that, that we missed that you wanna add in any of the questions? Like maybe um, you're remembering something now that we didn't, that, that wasn't mentioned? Uh, no, I think we've, we've covered most things pretty, um, pretty well. Like I'm, I'm excited to, continue to provide great information in the space and always deliver, you know, high quality, highly credible information. So people can ultimately um, take control of their health and, you know, take matters into their own hands and, and improve their quality of life so that they can be better at the things that they do. For example, better decision-making with stocks, trading, things like that, um, because they can really make a difference like massively, if you can work an extra one hour per day more, and you're more switched on you feel, and you're, you're more productive, just think about the net outcome that, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a dramatic, um, it's a multiplier really. <laughs> yeah, I, I agree. Everyone here wants to live a better life. And if you're more productive, if you're thinking more clearly, then you're going to be able to just massively increase and leverage your, your abilities. And Lucas, I will tag your channel because I know that you have a large and fast growing YouTube channel. Can you also tell people where they can find you, your website, your podcast and things of that nature? Yeah, sure. Thanks, your, David. Your email sure. Um, so if they search boost your biology on YouTube, um, go and subscribe to my YouTube channel. They can also search boost your biology podcast. I have my own podcast. Um, they can search um, my website, ergo, e -R -G -O -G -E -N -I -C, ergogenic.health. Um, my website has tons of great resources. And I've also recently developed a um, energy optimization program. If people are interested, that's called Limitless um, that you can find on my website as well. 
And for some of my high net worth viewers, do you do like private consultations or things of that nature? I know that, that, it, that your time is very limited and valuable, but is that something that you would consider if, if people reach out to you and they have like a specific problem and they wanted you to coach them through it? Absolutely. Uh, I do enjoy working with um, like executives, CEOs, entrepreneurs, um, all of those individuals that are looking to, again, just improve their perf performance by one or two percent. Um, I love working with individuals like that because I know what it's like to look at every single element of their life and optimize every single area. Um, so yeah, I do offer a coaching, a one-on-one -on -one coaching service as well, um, where I can dive extreme into extreme depth into your biology. Um, we, I do blood testing analysis, um, nutritional assessments, gut health assessments, hormone assessments. Um, so they can check that out as well on my website. Awesome. So I will link to your, your channel. And um, do you want people to contact you through your website if they have like a specific question or interested in like the one-on-one -on -one coaching or do you have an email that, or what's the best way for them to get in contact with you directly? Yeah, they can um, head over to my website. There's like a contact section or a, um, you can just submit a question there and I'll, I'll be notified as, as soon as possible. Awesome. So this wraps up the chat. If you guys can let me know your comments below. As I said, I know that, that bringing on um, an amazing biohacker is not necessarily content that you might be used to. But remember, a lot of the things that we went through from wearing blue blockers to getting morning sunlight, icing your balls, taking a few supplements, those are things that are very easy to implement and they can have massive changes. If you aggregate and combine some of them, maybe in total, you can be 10 or 15% more productive. And if you're able to make 10 or 15% better decisions or be that much more productive, then you can add, you know, potentially tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands of dollars in extra income in more quality time. You can feel better. You can feel less overwhelmed. You can spend more time with your friends and family. And um, I think that, that that would be incredible. So um, please join me in in following Lucas, because I think that he has tremendous value add. And this is David Jaffe with beststockstrategy.com. And I appreciate your attention. Thanks, David. Thanks for having me.